So first of all, let's talk about the pathogen. The coronavirus pandemic is caused by a pathogen called SARS-CoV-2, short for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2. As the name implies, it's a virus, meaning it hijacks the body cells and takes over their mechanism to reproduce inside them. The body cells are destroyed in the process, which is how it makes us ill. To go into a bit more detail, the virus uh, enters the cell through an enzyme found on our cell surface, and they incorporate their viral RNA with our own DNA. So when the DNA is used to make our own proteins, the, vi uh, the viral proteins are also made at the same time, using up our own resources and energy in the process. So next we'll talk about the risk factors. The risk factors are things that increase the risk of someone getting or developing a disease. We don't know enough about the virus to say if any particular factors are definitely risk factors, but the infection cases seem to show that males, people over 60 years old, and those with underlying health conditions are more susceptible to COVID. Other factors that can affect your risk include your living or hygiene conditions, and reportedly if you are of a, a black, Asian, or minority ethnic background. Then let's talk about the symptoms. There is a range of symptoms that can be caused by COVID-19, but we'll focus on the main ones here, which are the fever, a consistent cough, and shortness of breath. Let's have a think about how these symptoms can come about. So first of all, the fever. A common misconception that people have is that the pathogens themselves cause the fever by releasing chemicals into our body. Well, actually, the fever is an action of the body's immune system on the hypothalamus of the brain. The hypothalamus is at the base of the brain near the pituitary gland and it has a crucial role in homeostasis, which is the maintenance of our internal environment to keep it stable by negative feedback. Now, one of the things that is maintained by the hypothalamus is our core body temperature. Now, when the white blood cells detect the pathogens in our body, they will release these chemicals to the hypothalamus to raise our body temperature, which slows down or even prevents the reproduction of the pathogens. So having a fever is a sign of infection, but it's also a sign that your immune system is working properly. The problem is when you have a really high fever for a really long time, as it may mean that your immune system is compromised and it could lead to other complications such as dehydration. Another thing is that the animal proteins, such as enzymes, could denature at higher temperatures, which would then disrupt lots of our essential internal reactions. Secondly, the coughing. Having a cough usually implies that there is something in your airway that you're trying to get rid of. Usually this is mucus that traps pathogens and dust in your trachea and bronchi. Mucus is normally removed from the airway by cilia, which beats in a synchronized motion to waft the mucus up the trachea to the throat where you could either cough or spit it out or swallow it to your stomach to be destroyed by the hydrochloric acid there. However, in the case of COVID, a dry or what we call a non-productive cough usually means no mucus is being coughed out. And it's actually hard to say what exactly triggered the dry cough. A possible reason is that there is excess mucus production in the nose due to COVID or other irritants and this excess mucus could drip down to the throat, which tickles some of the nerves there, triggering a cough. Some patients also experience a wet or productive cough, in which case the excess mucus produced by the respiratory tract is successfully removed along with the virus in it. Finally, the third symptom that we'll talk about is the shortness of breath. Now, this one can show up in the later stages of the infection, and it's actually tricky to say if it's just one thing or, or multiple things that trigger uh, the symptom. Shortness of breath is common for people with asthma and people who produce excess mucus due to a restricted flow of air in the trachea. For asthmatic patients, this, this is due to the smooth muscles in the trachea contracting more than usual, leading to a smaller lumen of the airway. For people who produce excess mucus, it's harder for the cilia in their body to remove the mucus as there's so much of it. This is usually the case for people with a flu infection or medical conditions such as cystic fibrosis or smokers. This is the same for COVID if the virus has reached the lower respiratory tract, which is the trachea and the lungs, uh, which is an indication that the infection has passed the initial stage where it just stay in the upper respiratory tract, uh, that is your nose and your throat. Now things get really messy if the virus gets to the lower respiratory tract. Having dealt with the virus for a long time, your immune system can go into overdrive and can cause widespread inflammation in many essential organs. The lungs are one of them. 
In an attempt to kill the virus, the alveoli in your lungs are filled with liquid as a result of the inflammation there. However, as you know, the alveoli are essential in gaseous exchange. So if it's flooded, that means there is less gaseous exchange and your body can't efficiently get the oxygen in and the carbon dioxide out. The brain senses that the, the blood is low in oxygen, so the medulla, the part of the brain that controls automatic functions, will then send impulses to the respiratory system to breathe more rapidly to compensate for the lack of oxygen, hence the shortness of breath. This fluid accumulation in the alveoli is known as uh, the acute respiratory distress syndrome, or we call it ARDS. If this shortness of breath is caused by uh, ARDS, then this means the virus has already spread throughout your system and it's a serious complication of COVID, and you'd need to be admitted into hospital for proper treatment. People who survive ARDS would have to live with permanent lung damage and would have a lower quality of life. So those were some of the most common symptoms of COVID infection, but it's important to keep in mind that 40 to 45% people are asymptomatic, meaning they don't show any symptoms, but can still spread the virus. This is what makes SARS-CoV-2 such a dangerous virus, on top of the fact that it can permanently damage your health even if you're, you've recovered from it, unlike a common cold or influenza virus. In many cases, people do recover completely from it, but there is no telling if you can as well unless you go through it. So it's better to be careful now than, uh, than be sorry later. So let's talk about how the virus is transmitted. The virus is mostly transmitted by droplet infection, such as uh, saliva drops as you sneeze, cough or talk. These droplets can land on your hand uh, and on things that you touch, such as door handles and mobile phones. So it's essential to know how to properly protect yourself from taking the virus into your body. There is also some evidence that say that it can transmit by aerosol, which means the virus particles can float in the air up to three hours. But at the moment, there isn't enough evidence to confirm it. As the main method of transmission is droplet infection, wearing a face mask is one of the most straightforward way of protecting yourself and others. It can stop other people's droplets from landing onto your nose or your mouth, but the key function is to stop the droplets from coming out of you onto other people and things around you. Remembering the fact that people can be asymptomatic is a responsible and respectful thing to wear a face mask to protect the people around you while protecting yourself. It is essential to cover your nose and your mouth while wearing a mask in order to be properly protected. Many Asian countries and cities have a lower infection rate and numbers. However, they are closer to the origin of the pandemic and also have a higher population density than the UK. But the reason why they have such a lower infection rate and numbers is because the majority of the people there are used to wearing face masks when they're ill, uh, stopping the spread at early stages of the pandemic. So that is something that we can learn from them. Another thing that you need to do is to wash your hands regularly with soap and water. Hand sanitizers with at least 70% alcohol also works if there isn't any soap or water available. Social distancing is also really important, especially if you're not wearing a face mask. It reduces the probability of you inhaling the droplets when you talk to someone or just simply passing by people who are talking. Generally speaking, it's extremely important to have a higher sense of maintaining your hygiene. Put down the toilet lid before flushing can prevent the virus from being propagated around the toilet along with your excretion particles. Sterilize your everyday items wherever possible, such as your mobile phone. This can be done easily by taking the phone case out and washing it with soap and warm water and wiping the screen and the buttons using an alcohol wipe. Then let's talk about treatment. As the virus takes over cells to reproduce, it's always been hard to develop effective medicine to cure viral diseases without damaging our body cells in the process. This means actually there is no cure for viral diseases most of the time. It is the same in this case, but what we can do is to treat the symptoms as best as we can using painkillers and anti-inflammatory drugs. Keep in mind antibiotics won't work on the virus as they only kill bacteria. There has been some research done on producing drugs to target the proteins on our cell membranes that let the virus into the cell, but no medicine has been developed yet. But let's hope that there's something would, uh, will come up in the future. With that being said, so what's going to happen now? As you have seen on the news, there has been many talks of developing a successful vaccine for COVID-19, 
and indeed that is the best hope we can have for dealing with this virus. As you may recall, vaccines are dead or inactive pathogens that are injected into our body to trigger a primary immune response without making us ill. The key goal of vaccines is to make our immune system to produce memory cells which will survive long after the pathogen has been killed. The aim is that these memory cells will recognize the actual live pathogen when it does invade our body and can quickly induce a secondary immune response where it produces large concentrations of antibodies in a short time to kill the pathogens before they can cause symptoms. If more than 90% of the population is vaccinated, we can have herd immunity where the pathogen can't survive long enough in the host to reproduce and be spread to other people. Meaning those who cannot be vaccinated for various reasons can be can be protected from the pathogen as well. In the case of COVID, there has been talks of an effective vaccine being developed, but more testing is needed to test its efficacy, toxicity and side effects. Same as what you would do with drug trials. Recently, there has been uh, the first report of a man who was reinfected after completely recovering from COVID. This is a really interesting discovery as there are many uh, promising findings in there. One of the thing is that they found higher concentrations of antibodies in his bloodstream in the second infection, which implies that the memory cells made from his first exposure to the virus um, are retained. Another important thing to note is that he is asymptomatic the second time around, meaning the virus was unable to make him sick upon reinfection, at least to this point in time, possibly due to the faster secondary immune response. However, being asymptomatic doesn't mean he cannot transmit the virus to others, so this would mean that recovered patients should still wear face masks and exercise social distance as non-infected people. The vaccines being developed also need to be tested to see if it can provide long or short-term immunity to help with designing the vaccination program. In any case, there is some very promising research being done, so let's hope an effective vaccine will be developed in the near future.